Insider Movie Talk, Movie Talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. Jack Reacher. I'll never go back. <laughs> also, your host of Collider Heroes, John Schnepp. Ah, oh, it's so disappointing. Just horrible news. Horrible, <laughs> horrible news. Also, your host of Jedi Council, Christian Harloff. I don't have to answer to the likes of you. <laughs> also, here, Mark Ellis. Calling out around the world. Are you ready for a movie talk? A movie talk. Oh, nice segue. Nice segue. Thank you. Hey, guys, as happens sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> As happens sometimes, some news dropped like literally five seconds ago before we started this show. We're going to get to that right now. Apparently, David Heyman, who is the producer of the Harry Potter franchise and the upcoming Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, he works a lot with Warner Brothers. They've just announced, it's being reported in Variety at any rate, that they have acquired the rights from Road Dolls Estate to Willy Wonka. They have acquired the rights to Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory from the studio, and they are planning, Warner Brothers is planning on making a brand new Willy Wonka film. Christian, you heard about this just moments ago. Yeah. Your thoughts on this? I mean, listen, anytime you hear that they're going to be doing, the first time they said it, we're going to be remaking Willy Wonka, you go, come on, why? Why are you going to remake Willy Wonka? But then you think about why they're doing it this time, and I'll tell you why. It's a mulligan for the last disaster when they did it, because when Michael Jackson was playing Willy Wonka, um, instead of, and, and I think that you have this movie now, this, what they could do, and they have the producer of the Harry Potter movies, and you can really bring, I think, show a lot more of the respect to the original movie, and now, because this is a very delicate thing now with the passing of Gene Wilder. Yes. So. <laughs> they, they would not approach this if they're not going to take it in a totally different direction here and pay homage to what he did, what the movie was in the first place. So I think, although I'm not behind it because I still don't necessarily think you need it, I understand why they're doing it because they want to make up for that thing that happened in 2005. Schnepp? You know, I, I think it's a, a, a cool thing. And, you know, we've already had a, a sequel or a remake, that is, of uh, Willy Wonka. And I don't mind seeing a brand new version. For me, uh, the Gene Wilder one is always the one that I'll hold dear to my heart. Sure. But I would love to see a newer interpretation of it and do the, for them to go further through the glass elevator, so to speak. You know, I, I think it's a great idea. Mark? Uh, I like Christian's golf reference when he said mulligan. And sometimes you get a mulligan and you get to hit another ball. Sometimes you take your clubs and you get the hell off the golf course because you don't <laughs> belong there in the first place. I think this is incredibly disrespectful to announce this and have this deal happen so soon after Gene Wilder died. And apparently it's going to be, it's not an origin story. It's going to be some sort of a telling as Willy Wonka more in his, his youth and exploring different places. Mm. And that sounds like a good idea if it wasn't Willy Wonka. We don't need this. Nobody needs this. I do not need this. And I don't think that do you to need make this? up for the 2005 <laughs> that you need to. I, I don't need this. I don't need it at all. I really don't need this. Nobody needs this. Mark, um, I think I need this. Jack Reacher never goes back. <laughs> Willy Wonka should never go back. You need a hug. Um, you, know, you know what? Here's one of the really weird things. Um, uh, as you know, I've said in the show before, I'm not really a, a big Tim Burton fan. I didn't mind his different look at Willy wow. Wonka before. And I know I'm, I'm totally in the minority about that, and I'll never try to convince anybody that it's a good movie. But I, I know for me it worked, and I enjoyed what they were going for. I'm nowhere near as good as the original classic. I mean, not at all. But still, it worked for me. I like this idea, especially in... Look, when you got producers of the caliber like this, mm -hmm. who clearly knows how to handle a property and do it well, if nothing else, I think the way they approach this film is to say this is an homage to Gene Wilder. This is to honor Gene Wilder. We're going to do this and we're going to, because I know I'm in the minority, we're going to make up for that last one we did, everybody. We're going to tell you new parts of the story and go in a different direction. I, I think it can work. I think this is a decent, I at least think this is a decent thing to try. This is something to take a swing at. And if you do it along the lines of what you were mentioning, then you have franchise potential as well, all, right. all built in there as one. So I see it from a, from a business point of view. I see the potential upside from a creative point of view. This could be an unmitigated disaster, no doubt. But I think there is upside. I mean, it's a kind of a similar to what they tried to do, I think, with Oz, right? Mm, if you go right, back yeah. to what they did with the James, Franco. the James Franco thing and the younger, the Sam Raimi version of it, didn't really catch, I think, the way that they wanted it to. 
So it could be similar to that, to where they're trying to set up the world a little bit more. Because if you think about it, there are some interesting things to be told in there if they do. I understand what oh, you're saying. I, it's I get it. I'm not saying there isn't potential to explore new things in this universe, but the timing sucks. Yeah, I agree. That's the awesome. Sucks, they didn't make they didn't make the new Oz movie right after Judy Garland died. You right. know, I think it's I think it's incredibly disrespectful to make this announcement now. I think it's stupid. I, I can totally see why you think that way. I, I just got to admit, I was that in a good mood five minutes ago. <laughs> John. I was singing. I was dancing. For me, it, it struck me when I read it the opposite way than it struck you. But I can totally see yeah. why you. It struck me as you know what this is actually really good timing. Now something that will make us think even more about Gene Wilder, mm -hmm. like to honor Gene Wilder. But I could totally see why people like yourself. Would look and at and it. if you're say saying that Gene so. Wilder doesn't own the property, that I, he is Willy Wonka now. He didn't write it. He was he was hired to play a part. Yeah. And sometimes art takes over, and you have to let that guy be Willy Wonka. And I can't imagine somebody else doing it. And I think I'd be on your side a little bit more if Gene Wilder wasn't so outspoken against the last one. He mm. thought he thought yeah. it was. He said that the last one was disrespectful. He didn't he didn't like the last one at all. So I, I yeah. he's because he that was because he thought it was bad. Well, it <laughs> yeah. was. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's go on to our next Guardians kind of story. All right, Marvel has released the first trailer and post for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Written and directed by James Gunn, the follow-up reunites Guardians Star-Lord, Gamora, Drax, Rocket, and Baby Groot as they battle a new threat in search of Peter Quill's father. The movie opens in theater on May 5th, 2017. John, thoughts on the new trailer and poster? Uh, the first thing I saw today before the trailer dropped was the poster, and I love it. This Love poster. Mm -hmm. This poster is great. And you know what? Let's bring up the poster again, guys. You know, I didn't even notice Groot in it. It wasn't until, Jan if you have to look down by uh, Star-Lord's foot, it wasn't until James Gunn posted a picture, zoomed in on that. He goes, by the way, guys, in case you missed it, it's like, ah, there he is. <laughs> I love this poster. It's great. And it's awesome to see Yondu in the poster as mm -hmm. well. That's great. But then the trailer dropped. And remember, this is a teaser trailer, it's a minute 30, just a hair under a minute 30, for a movie that's, I can't even remember how many months away. It's a long ways off still. Awesome. I thought it was awesome. It didn't tell us anything about the story at all. It just reminded us, hey guys, these dudes that you love hanging out with in the movie theater, they're back. Then one of my favorite shots, we actually talked about this on Heroes. Check out Heroes a little bit later today at 2 p.m. Eastern. But this great shot of Yondu and Rocket walking side by side with a bunch of bodies beside them. I'm like, I want to see this so mm. bad. <laughs> but to me, like, I, and again, I mentioned this on Heroes earlier today. When you got Drax the Destroyer playing, being played by Dave Bautista, he had a moment in Guardians of the Galaxy that was probably my single hardest laughing moment of any film that year, which was that simple line. It's not funny when I say it, but it's like, this green whore mm -hmm. is my friend. Mm -hmm. Like, I, 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 almost, I almost choked on my popcorn. It was so funny. The way they use him is so great. And then they have a scene in this trailer that's very reminiscent of that with this, you need a woman who is pathetic like you. Do you need a hug? I mean, it was just a great way to end that off. So the visuals look great. They used the right music again. It brought me back to that feeling I had when I watched the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. As a teaser, I mean, this crushed it. Just crushed it. I was already excited for this movie. I'm flipping my lid for it now. Dernay hey, Schnepp, you had a chance to watch this trailer. What did you think about it? Yeah, when does it come out? May? Can it be May tomorrow? Like, <laughs> why do we have to wait? I mean, when I saw this trailer, it just reignited that scene that we saw at Hall H where you just get a little clip of the power of Yondu. Like people have underestimated this guy. You might've seen a few things that he can do. Just wait till you see the full power of Yondu. It's pretty scary, but everything in this little teaser is fantastic. Everything that they've shown without showing you, kind of, you don't know anything. They're just showing you, hey, the team is back. They're in a brand new adventure. Everyone's here get ready and it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun so for me this is a perfect teaser because i just want more i feel like this is exactly what it is a teaser like where's the trailer it's like yeah i'm sold already you know and, and just yeah may 5th is the release may date for 5th. the film it cannot get here fast uh, enough mark you had a chance to finally see it actually you and dennis did a reaction video yes to the trailer look for that as soon as movie talk is over make sure you check out the main channel for collider video youtube.com slash collider video and look for that reaction but what was your thoughts about the trailer? if anybody needed a drax hug it's me after that willy wonka <laughs> news and i was so happy to get it dennis and i we actually sat down and we were watching it and we didn't realize 
was we were watching the Russian language version. So we're like, oh, this is great, <laughs> but they're not speaking English. It's actually recorded. It lives somewhere in the ether that we're probably never released. And then we did the English one, and I loved watching this thing, man. Well, the only thing that bummed me out is that the rest of the world can't see all the stuff that we got to see in Hall H yet. I thought we might get more of that, right. but this was just to announce to the world at large that there is a sequel to Guardians of the Galaxy coming out. Here's your favorite characters. It was very interesting that we got to see Drax and Gamora and Star Lord in one sequence, and then we saw Groot and Rocket in another one. Right. So we're going to have to reunite our friends at some point during this movie to go on this next adventure. This is what a teaser trailer should do. Knocked it out of the park. Christian, I want to ask, like, first, what your impressions of the trailer, what you thought about it, but also, look, it's May 5th. That is over six months away at, at this point. Was this the right time to drop this trailer? It's beyond the right time. And, and, the, and James Gunn, I think, says he's going to put out another trailer uh, pretty soon, soon which would make soon, sense because Doctor Strange comes out any minute now. That's a Marvel film. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it would make all the sense in the world to put that out there. Six months is a good, first of all, for a teaser. Yeah. And the poster alone is like a Joan Jett album. It's amazing. Right. Oh, it's a I love like, the kind of <laughs> mid 80s look. It's, it's amazing. Early 80s look. I, I love the poster. The trailer was great because we did get a chance to see that Hall H stuff and we kind of know what's coming in the big epic grand form and there's, there's bits of that in this little teaser mm -hmm. from what Chris Pratt said about how big and epic this movie is going to be like the most grand space hopper type thing and you see that in there but what it does I thought it was really smart the way that uh, they teased it with the song Hooked on a Feeling once again you get that song because you're familiar with that when you hear that song now on the radio as long as that song's been around now you think of Guardians of the Galaxy so right away when it's back on screen okay good so I'm familiar with it oh now I'm familiar with the characters again because here they are oh now I'm familiar why I love them so much because there's that banter that I fell in love with them in the first place mm -hmm. and knowing that I have seen this other footage of what they're going to do and knowing a little bit more context to that scene when they're walking with the bodies around them it just gets you that much more excited. But as far as marketing goes, you absolutely have to put this before Doctor Strange. And you also or have to have in whether the, the, the longer trailer, which I think might drop before Strange, even if it doesn't, you got Rogue One right around the corner mm -hmm. too. So right. Disney has places to market this and get the awareness out again that it's coming, it's coming back. Yeah, for as far as a teaser, like if this was the final trailer to come out before the movie came out, I go, right. that's all right. 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 But as a teaser, uh, six so months good. out, back. they just, yeah, uh, yeah absolutely, yeah. they completely nailed Until it. Until three years ago, we, yeah. who would ever thought that Hooked on a Feeling would remind us of anything other than the dancing baby for like the first thing <laughs> as soon as you <laughs> think of it. Now it's Guardians. Yeah, yeah it's It is now Guardians Uga, of the Galaxy. Chaka, Uga, that's it, instantly. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what, guys? Before all this stuff dropped today about Willy Wonka and Guardians of the Galaxy, it was actually a pretty slow news day. So we thought, you know what? Let's get caught up on our mailbag. Look, if you guys have a topic or a question you want us to address on Movie Talk, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. We answer a couple questions every day. Every month or so, we take most of our episode and just take them. Also, we have mailbag on Saturdays and Sundays. So send on in your email question. You never get it on unless you send one in. So Ashley, what is our first question out of the mailbag today? Jana Marbot writes, greetings and salutations, Collider crew. Like most of you guys, I really like the first Jack Reacher movie and have been excited for the new one. Have you guys had the chance to see it yet? If so, what did you think? Thanks and keep up the amazing work. Yeah, I really liked the, the first Jack Reacher movie. I, I, I even liked the last act, even though I thought the last act took a step backwards from the first two acts. I thought it was great, and I have been very, very excited about seeing a brand new one. I have never liked the title, to be honest, never go back, and I like the title even less after watching the movie. It just really doesn't make much no. sense. I shouldn't have gone back. It was <laughs> disappointing. Um, the, the movie starts with a bang. The first five minute scene that they show a bunch of in the trailer, really sharp and got me hyped like it got me ready and I, I really i'm not going to go into too much detail it's it's a bad script it's just there's no way around it it's a bad script um tom cruise i thought was solid he played the role just fine damn that dude looks good for 54 years old like holy crap but you know the script being weak was just too much to overcome for this movie i didn't hate it i know that there are some people in this room that did hate the film I didn't hate it. I thought there was enough upside to keep me from hating it, but not nearly enough for me to like it. Uh, I ended up disliking this film. I was disappointed with it. So uh, anyway, Mark, you were sitting right beside me. Yep. What did you think about yeah, well, it? Well, Jack Reacher goes back like three or four times in this movie, <laughs> just, to, just to kick the title in the face a little bit. There's like, he leaves the place and he has to get back to that place. This movie's not fun. 
It's not a fun movie at all. And I don't need every action movie to have a lot of chuckles in. That's not what I'm talking about. But it doesn't move at a good pace. It's a very clunky shoot shot movie from one scene to the next scene. There's just no life to this. It's just a very plotting movie. And the worst part about it is the writing is terrible, but Tom Cruise has nothing really to do here. Yeah. And it's very disappointing. Like, look, if you want to throw Jason Statham in a bad action movie, fine. I'll even take Liam Neeson in a dud once in a while. But this is Tom Cruise, man. The guy's a national treasure. You got to He's got to treat himself better than this because, as Christian pointed out to me in our review, he produced this movie. It's like, why? who has dirt on him that is making him continue to go back and do Jack Reacher movies? Think of all the great Tom Cruise movies you've seen. This is one we got a sequel to. Uh, Christian, you were sitting there with us. What did you think? I didn't hate it as much as Mark, and I think I liked it a little more than you, but it's not a good movie. Uh, it's not written very well, and that's why I said in the beginning, there literally is a line where someone goes, I don't have to answer the likes of you. It's like, so, who wrote that? I, I know. I think you'd see a bunch of people in the theater looking around each other. It's like, did they really just say and that? And that happens, <laughs> it happens often in the movie. Yeah. It, it, but, it's like, wait, 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 watch, watch, watch this. He's yeah. about to say, because that's what I would do. Watch. And, sure and, he, and, he's, uh, and there's a lot of cliches in there throughout the entire movie, but I'm also with you guys. I was hooked for the first 10, 15 minutes. Great opening. I was yeah. hooked. I'm like, oh, this is going to be a lot better because I didn't love the first one. And then I'm like, oh, this this is a little bit more interesting. It turns into a family road trip film at one point. Kind of, yeah. Kind of. It turns into a family road trip movie, and you're with, with action, and it's not fun. You're right, but but it never knows when to try to have a sense of humor no. either because there's certain scenes and, where you're like, oh, we should be having a joke here, and it just it just kind of fizzles out. And I, didn't, weird. and I didn't think I thought Tom Cruise was the only one that was really good in the movie. I thought everybody else, who, people that I like normally, I thought all of their performances were subpar. And I also think it's interesting because Ed Zwick directed this. Mm -hmm. and he's a good director. Glory. I mean, Last Samurai. I mean, this is a guy who has worked with, with Cruise in the past. It just it didn't work. As far as you asking why he would do this, the guy likes to try to build franchises. So I get it. I mean, well, he's why building is this a, the franchise? He tried build. to do yeah. it. I mean, look, it's the first Jack Reacher, some people enjoyed it very much. So I, I don't, I don't chastise him for trying to build off a new franchise. He's got Mission Impossible. He's got this. He's possibly with Edge of Tomorrow. Now he's doing the Monster movie. The guy builds. I so want to see I, an I Edge of Tomorrow it. sequel. I would have rather seen a Top Gun sequel. I'd rather see a sequel to Legend. I'd rather see a sequel to Days of Thunder before this piece of crap. I'll, I'll tell you, like, I thought this was a movie worth taking a crack at. I thought doing a Jack, mm -hmm. a Jack Reacher sequel was worth taking a crack. did not work. But you're talking about the performances. Like, I really like Tom Cruise. I really like Colby Smulders. There's no chemistry between them and this. And you want to highlight how badly written this script is. I, I didn't look it up. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm about, maybe I'm about to put egg on my face and a woman wrote this script. But man, there's a scene in this where Colby Smulders, who's in the military, gives this big rousing speech about, I've had to deal with men and, and like uh, the, the discrimination against me. And boy, you can tell it was written by a man. You could so tell it was written by a man because the way the, the the words were so not natural, they did not flow right. That could have been a really powerful scene that really established that character, and it just goes back again the script. But anyway, Shep, you still excited to see Jack Reacher? Never go back. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was excited yesterday. Did we just poop under your Christmas tree? You sort of pooped. Can we talk about Guardians again? That was an awesome <laughs> teaser trailer. Yeah, you know, I was ready to go. I was ready to go back. And now I'm not. Some I mean, of the action scenes are okay. Like, like you're yeah, not going to hate okay. yourself if you watch it on cable, no, but it's no, not no, a movie no, no, you no. hate to see. Sorry, yeah. three people, all with different viewpoints, all saying it's not a good movie. To me, as somebody who's like, you know, I value my 20 bucks, and then, you know, the additional monies of other people going and eating and having fun. There's a lot of other movies that I'll probably go see now. Just because, number one, it doesn't have Werner Herzog in it, again. <laughs> I should have brought him back. But... You guys' opinions on it, you know, has swayed me to uh, rethink it. All right, what's next? Steve Calderon writes, should Universal be worried about Fifty Shades Darker and Fifty Shades Freed bombing at the box office? There was so much negativity with the first one. I wonder if people are still going to see these two films. The second one is going up against the Lego Batman movie and John Wick Chapter 2 on the same weekend. Well, first of all, I don't think it needs to worry about its competition because the people who are going to see the Lego Batman movie and the people who would be interested in seeing John Wick 2 are generally speaking not people who would be interested in seeing Fifty Shades Darker. That being said, uh, two months ago, I would have said, yes, they should have put this movie out even faster. I would have said, yes, because of the negative reaction to the first one, it had like a 70% drop off from week one to week two. It's in trouble. However, then its trailer came out and it beat 
the Star Wars The Force Awakens record for most views of a trailer in the first 24 or 48 hours. Clearly, there are people out there who are really interested in this film. I, I, I'm going to kind of predict, I don't think it'll make like the 75 or 85 million that the first one made on its opening weekend, but it's going to do solid business on its opening weekend. And then I predict another massive steep drop off between week one and week two. Now, look, my good friend Josh Makuga would say I th he thinks a lot of people tuned in to watch that trailer because they thought they were going to see some good softcore porn. Uh, and that's <laughs> probably true. That's probably true. Probably a lot of 15 year old dudes who had no intention of seeing this movie wanted to check out the trailer, see if there was anything good to see. Um, but look, when you got when you break the record for the most views of a trailer of all time and you beat Star Wars The Force Awakens, you got to think there are people out there who are going to go out on opening weekend and check it out. I don't know, Mark. Do you think it's in trouble? I don't put a lot of stock in YouTube records yet. And plus, I really think that a lot of people watch that as a joke. You know, I, I think people, it's a lot easier to click something on YouTube than it is to actually pay money to go see something. I thought the trailer was good, though, I mean, for what it's trying to do. And this thing has to open the weekend it's opening. So it doesn't matter. There could be a Star Wars movie, a Mission Impossible movie. You could have Willy Wonka Never Go Back opening the same weekend. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's Valentine's Day weekend. So you got to open your Fifty Shades movie then. I think it'll do fine. I do think you're going to have an easier time getting somebody who would have wanted to see Fifty Shades of Grey going to see John Wick 2 instead this year than you would last year or go see Lego Batman instead. So I think that the alternatives are a little bit uh, of a better choice than they were when Fifty Shades of Grey opened. I think it'll do well. I don't know if it'll be number one though because John Wick has a lot of interest too. No, I, I, I'm more concerned about if I'm either the Lego movie, the Lego Batman movie or John Wick 2, I'm more concerned about the other one of those. Like if I'm John Wick, I'm more right. concerned about the Lego movie. That's a great if I'm the point. Lego movie, I'm more concerned about John because Wick. Because let's not forget, that has Lego and that has Batman yeah. in one movie. So you gotta think that's There's gonna be number one. There's a lot of crossover one. audience. There's a lot of crossover yeah. audience between John Wick and that, not so much Fifty Shades. Mm. Schnapp, what do you think about all this? Well, I mean, I think uh, the writer, didn't she write this book as like a Twilight fan fiction? Yes. And then it just kind of yeah. turned into this thing. And now this second one is directed by her, uh, her husband. Is it directed by it? Yeah. Or is he, it was it written by it? Let me, I'll look that up. I thought, I thought they replaced, I think uh, replaced the director with her husband is what the last That's thing. probably not a great move, artistically speaking. Um, so yeah, you know, I didn't see the first Fifty Shades, so I'm probably going to wait till the fourth movie, Fifty Shades <laughs> Freer. Uh, not free, I'm going to wait for the fourth one. Or Fifty Shades Lighter. I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to, I don't know when I'm going to see the fourth or perhaps the fifth one, but I'll wait until that to decide on a, you know, what I'm going to do with this. But yeah, I'm definitely going to be a big pass on this one. Christian. Yeah, and no, James Foley is directing it. Okay, right. Yeah, not, her husband's writing it. Okay, right. Yeah. Um, this movie is clearly not, a good move, by the way. Yeah. Right. Have her husband write it. <laughs> this yeah. movie is going to crush. It is going to do very well. And I'll tell you, it's not going to bomb at all. And I'll t did people watch in to see what was going on and extra people watch a trailer that didn't see the movie? Sure. Um, but it's, go it's coming out on Valentine's Day. The book was a phenomenon. Like the books alone, yeah. trashy, trashy books that were written by, uh, uh, you know, a third grader. But it still it has like it, it's it's going to do well. And because of the fact of the competition alone, if you look at that particular weekend when people want to go to the movies on Valentine's Day, majority of couples aren't going to go, hey, let's go see the Lego movie right. or hey, let's go see John Wick. Unless it's like that. Hey, honey, I did one for you. You do one for me. That's what's going to happen <laughs> for the majority of it. And then a lot of people are going to go, how about Fifty Shades of Grey for Valentine's Day? I think that that will. Do you think it's number one at the box office? Yes. Over Lego Batman? Yes. Woo. I think I, I'll, I, put, I, I'll put five bucks on it. But I do think the Lego Batman will do well because and also the difference between Lego Batman versus John Wick, you're looking at it from our eyes here when you first see a lego movie commercial it's a kids your kids sure. movies are, are the majority of the audience that's going after so you have a kids movie a hardcore action movie and a hardcore porn i mean uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a stupid movie uh so but all three of those movies have different audiences ashley as the as the creator of the phrase honey do one for me and i'll do one for you uh what do you think about the 50 shades this whole question about 50 shades um, I have to say that me and Mark did a trailer reaction to this, and I didn't like the first Fifty Shades movie, um, but the trailer kind of surprised me. And even in the comment section of that video, people commented like, "You have to read this. You have to read the book." Obviously, you didn't read the book, and it's like fans <laughs> of this franchise are so hardcore that no matter what the the result of the first one was, they're gonna see this movie no matter what. And I agree with Christian; it's gonna crush it at the box office for sure. 
All right, guys. Well, listen, it is Wednesday, which means it's time for us to do our little feeling old segment. We're going to talk about AMC Rewind, brought to you by our good friends at AMC Theaters. This is where we talk about the films that opened 10 years ago this week and opened 20 years ago this week, celebrating their 10th anniversaries this week. What a weekend 10 years ago. Flags of Our Fathers, Marie Antoinette, and the Christopher Nolan film, The Prestige, celebrating, this one's tough, the 20 year anniversary. Sleepers, Swingers, and the all time classic to Jillian on her 37th birthday, which I will admit I don't ever remember even hearing about before. So, Nick Schnepp, let's go to you. You hear about these six films. Which ones of these stands out to you? Uh, to Jillian on her 37th <laughs> of the birthday was the one that, no, I don't, I don't I never heard of that either. I was like, when did that get made? <laughs> anyway, 20 sorry. years ago, apparently. Maybe I should see it. I don't know if it's amazing, but I missed it. But uh, the ones that stick out to me, I thought Marie Antoinette was a pretty cool, weird film. It was a, a Coppola, Sofia Coppola's, yep. uh, a, you know, follow-up to her uh, Lost well, in Translation. Bill, Bill Murray, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I thought that was a lot of fun, but the, really the one that sticks out to me is The Prestige. Now, that was a really fun film. Hugh Jackman, who was the other guy in it? Uh, uh, Christian Bale. Christian Bale, Michael what a great, Caine. Yeah, what a great team. What a, what a cool look into the idea of what magic, and obviously it has some sci-fi elements. One of my favorite scenes of all time is David Bowie as Tesla walking through, like, just this an electrical storm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's fantastic. The visuals are great. So for me, it's the prestige. And it really, it holds up as if you watch it tomorrow, you will be just as entranced as when it came out. So. Christian? But, I mean, look, this is a, both 10 and 20 years ago. A lot of great Pretty movies special here, films, too. Yeah. It's, it's funny because Flags, Flags of Our Fathers, I didn't love, but Letters to Iwo you know, I did love mm. the sister piece that I really thought was pretty good. Obviously, Prestige, but I want to go back to the 20 years. I think the two, obviously, Swingers. I think Swingers, sure. to me, is a classic movie. It's the one that really gave uh, John Favreau the career that he's got today, and Vince Vaughn, the same thing. It just showed what Vince Vaughn could do with his comedy chops. But Sleepers, man, I think Sleepers is a movie that not enough people talk about. It's it's not a it's not a multiple-view movie, I'll right, tell you that, right. but it, it's got a hell of a cast in it. It's got some dark issues, for yeah. sure. Um, and that's, it also shows what Kevin Bacon... Kevin Bacon is a guy that it's like he could play the creepiest of creeps, but then he yeah. can also play a good dude and you still buy it. Like some guys can't, yeah. some actors and actresses can't do that. You, they're, they are just typecasted. Once they play a bad guy, and he does that in that movie, obviously, too. So Sleepers is the one that stands out, I think, out of all of them. Yeah, Kevin Bacon just had a show on TV that lasted just only a couple seasons. We called The Following. Yeah. That I actually thought was a pretty darn good little show. I, I thought it ended a little bit too soon. Anyway, which ones of these films stand out? I never to you? liked Kevin Bacon since he came to that small town and brought that <laughs> rock and roll with him. I don't approve of that. Uh, I loved Swingers just for what it meant for the independent film community community what it meant for Vince Vaughn's career in particular because Steven Spielberg even saw Swingers and is like I should get that guy to be in Jurassic Park The Lost World like mm. that was a huge huge movie for everybody involved not the least which was Vince Vaughn and it announced him as a movie star and it's always cool to go back and see like and sometimes people's career build gradually but with Vince Vaughn you watch Swingers and you're like that's that's a that's what a movie star is, like right there. And it's kind of cool to see that leap off the screen. So that's the one for me. Also, Swingers, it's got so many great locations. It introduced a lot of people to Marty and Elaine. So check it out. <laughs> ah, that's right. That's right. All right, what's next? Rudy Pena writes, Hello, Collider crew. I have watched you guys since the AMC days, and I think you all do an excellent job with the show. My question is about Creed 2. I absolutely love the Rocky series, and I saw Creed six times in theaters. I would love nothing more than to have Ryan Coogler direct the sequel, but I know that's not going to happen. I think Harloff has a great idea with Gavin O'Connor directing, but what about Stallone directing? As far as I know, there's no rush on Expendables 4, and I don't think there's anything else he's working on. Would love to hear your thoughts. You know what? When we heard that Coogler probably wasn't going to direct Creed 2, we we're all disappointed because Creed was such a surprise. I'll, I'll admit it that when I first heard they're going to do Creed, I'm like, really? You're going back to that? You're going back to the to the to the Rocky universe again? Oh, now it's going to be Apollo's son. But then we heard, you know, Coogler was going to be directing it with Michael B. Jordan. They just did Fruitvale Station together, and that combination was a powerhouse. It's like, okay, maybe. And then we saw the trailers. It's like, okay, this could be good. Then we saw the movie and we were all blown away by it. Mm -hmm. We were all disappointed when we heard that Coogler wasn't coming back. Look, I do believe, I think Stallone could bring something to this as a director. I really do. Uh, I think that could be really interesting. Now, look, it's the same thing as I always say. There are a thousand directors out there. There are a thousand good, talented directors that you could attach to this and it would work and it would work out fantastic. Coogler's still attached as a producer on it. 
So that means he's gonna give a little bit of oversight to the story, that's important. But you know, I think Stallone would be a nice pick. I don't know, what do you think, Christian? He's directed four of the Rocky movies. He directed right. Rocky II, Rocky IV, Rocky VI. Uh, oh, Rocky II, Rocky II, or excuse me, Rocky II, Rocky III, and Rocky VI. Yeah. And so maybe three of them he directed. He didn't do five? No, he didn't do five. Oh. Abelson came back. To oh, good, five. good. Um, so he did, yeah, he did two, three, four, and he did, and and Rocky Balboa. So four. Um, so he could do it, and who knows the franchise better than him? Yeah. Um, but I actually would like to stick to my choice, and I think Gavin O'Connor. I'd like to see Stallone step He'd back good. from it. Yeah. Um, would I be opposed to Stallone directing? Absolutely not. But I would rather see someone like a Gavin O'Connor do it and have to let Stallone focus on the role. He says he's not going to come back to do Rocky or he was, wasn't definitely going to do it. He'll do it and let him do it. You gotta, he's got to be the Mickey. He's got to be the Mickey to Adonis Creed. And let him focus once again, because look what he did when he wasn't directing the last time, and he could just hone in completely 100% as Rocky Balboa, and he recaptured what he did that was so great back in 1976 or 75 or 76 when he when he did the first movie. So I, I think that it's a fine choice, but I'm sticking with O'Connor. Mark, let me ask you this question. In the Rocky franchise up until this point, yeah. we had Adrian die off camera mm -hmm. between movies. We had Paulie die off camera Don't in between say it, movies. John. Is there a possibility John. that Creed 2 could start with Adonis at the grave site of Rocky Balboa and they just move move That'd the story cheap. on to that? I mean, right. it's something they have you done. You already know I'm in a bad mood because of the Willy Wonka <laughs> story. Now you're going to throw a dead Rocky on my doorstep? Come on, man. No, you got to have Stallone come back. I know he said that he wasn't sure he fits anymore in the franchise or he didn't want to come back to it, but that's what he said before Creed happened and before Cougar came to him with his great story that he just couldn't say no to. So I will agree with Christian. I think that Gavin O'Connor would be great. I think David O. Russell might be an interesting choice as well, but you have to have a story that's not just... It, 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 you got to have new wrinkles in this thing. It can't just be... A Adonis continuing his journey as a champion boxer. There needs to be something else involved. I hope that's not the death of Rocky, although they did touch on, you know, Rocky getting older and what happens to a lot of people as they progress in age over the years. So it would make me nervous that Stallone coming back would be coming back just so they could give him the final send off. But I don't think they would kill off his character unless he could say goodbye on screen. Schnepp, I want to ask you the same question about could we see him, could not we see him, could he die in between movies? But before I ask you that question let me read this quote to add a little bit more context at the santa barbara international film festival back in february sylvester stallone said the following about maybe thinking the character of rocky is done he said this i really have mixed feelings about this seriously i feel like rocky at the end of creed on the steps with the help of a young man and he looks out and he says from here you can see your whole life it sort of summarizes the whole thing. I don't know how much further you can go with Rocky. Hearing Stallone say that, what do you think are the possibilities of maybe Stallone, of Rocky being dead by the beginning of Creed II? Well, Sylvester Stallone has made a career out of returning to characters, so I would True. never say never, and I would never definitely, go back. I would, I would <laughs> not, like Jack, Jack Reacher, <laughs> never go back. I would go back. Um, and I think, I think Stallone will come back. What he was saying is like, look, you know, he thought he was done many times. Yeah. He thought he was done in the third one. He thought he was done on the fifth one. Then he did the sixth one. I mean, come on. Creed is a great story, and it's an especially great story for Rocky. I mean, it's this is the character's transformation into Mickey, basically. Yeah. And uh, the story's not done. I thought that's the, the growth of the character. It ends with the character's growth. Both of them grew, and they're both like, I can see where I'm at now. Like... It's not. It's not a. It's not the the headstone. It's. I think it's the beginning. So that's why I feel like it would be a disservice to have the gravesite. I just think that's such a cheap way that, and I, I don't like the way they did it with uh, Talia Shire, and I also don't like the way they mm -hmm. did it with uh, with Young. It's like it's it sucks. They're like, ah, you know, we didn't want to pay him, or they didn't want to do it, or whatever. So there, they're dead. What? And it's like I get it. That happens a lot, but that doesn't have to happen in this. And I specifically think they should keep Stallone. I wouldn't. I would like to not see him direct it. I'd like to see someone else direct it. But I'd like to see Stallone not only continue through in Creed two, but Creed three. I think that's a, their storyline is really good together. Well, I mean, they have more to do together. 
Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it paralleled a little bit. The, the Creed paralleled the first Rocky, and they have another fight to win together. They got. I mean, you got. He's got to get the gold. He's going after the gold. The same way Baby Carrot is going for the gold. He's got to go. He's got to go. <laughs> I think I'm going to have an easier time against then. Rogan. <laughs> we'll see. Um, but anyway, so I, st- I think that in order for them to do that, uh, you got to have him because even that moment to do it, you could do it with. Because I, I'll disagree and say it wasn't because they didn't want to pay him because there there was conversations to have Paulie back and even Adrian. The one thing it just it didn't fit in the story. It it, didn't, it, it didn't, I thought it was very effective that that it, scene it and that and I can't remember which Rocky was. I think it was six. When when he just talking about Adrian being gone mm. and because mm-hmm. here's the past. Impo- yeah, because the important thing wasn't the character dying. The important thing was what it did to Rocky at that point. I, I thought they handled it really well. well here's yeah. the thing about Creed and and his character Rocky. They are such different characters. Yeah, like, they are that yeah. like Creed has a lot of problems. He's a troubled dude. And that Rocky was able to help him get through it. It's not over. He's still trouble. It's not like you just get over that stuff quickly. He's still got a lot of trouble. So yeah. I don't know. I think it's like their characters together will help each other grow through this second. Let's get that dude who's playing Darth Vader in the suit for Rogue One. Let's get him to play Yvonne Drago's son. And then he comes <laughs> Hayden <knocking>. Christensen? <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's get Aiden Christensen. <laughs> All right, what's next? Powell Williamson writes, it's no secret that the last few installments in the Pirates of the Caribbean and Transformers franchises have been subpar to say the least, but somehow these movies continue to get made. With a trailer out for Pirates, Dead Men Tell No Tales, and new details revealed for Transformers the last night, which of these two movies, if either, do you think has the best chance to revitalize their respective franchise? Thanks for taking my question and keep bringing that sweet, sweet filthy. Oh, I love the sweet (laughs) filthy. Um, Look, here's the thing. We were talking about revitalizing them. Let's, Let's keep this in mind. These are both, from a business and financial point of view, these are very, very healthy franchises. Uh, The last Transformers movie made well north of a billion dollars. The last Pirates movie, if it didn't cross a billion dollars, it came damn close to crossing a billion dollars. Financially, these are blockbuster franchises and they still are. Quality-wise, they've both gone to the shitter. Um, I mean, like the first Transformers was, I I love the first Transformers movie. I thought it was great. I was one of the only guys online going, (laughs) Michael Bay is the right, he's not for everything, but Michael Bay is the right guy to do Transformers. And I love the first one. And for me personally, they've all gone right to crap ever since. They do, look, the only thing that's gonna save Transformers at this point is Michael Bay's gotta go. And I still think Michael Bay can make great movies. He's put out a couple other movies in the last few years, several of which I thought are pretty damn good. I just think it's time for him to get off this property. I, I, I'm, I am dreading what he's going to do with this next Transformers film. Just It looks like it's a total mess. But King Arthur's going to be in it. Uh, and, and, Hitler. Hitler. And, and Hitler. And Hitler. <laughs> and Winston Churchill. It's going to uh, be great. And Willy Wonka. Uh. <laughs> and Willy Wonka. Um, and X-23, apparently. So <laughs> here, look, as far as the Pirates goes... Look, just make a good movie. I mean, just start with a good story because their stories have become so convoluted um, that it's become difficult to watch them. And, like, is there a more charming character than Captain Jack Sparrow? You should be able to make a really good watchable film around this guy, and they have struggled with that ever since the first film. So if you're going to ask me which one of these has the better chance of getting better, like, because they're both healthy financially... I'd say Pirates has the better chance right now of getting better. I don't know. Christian, what do you think? I agree with you. Look, first of all, to answer your question is how they keep getting made, it's it's international box office also. The yeah. last Transformers movie crushed internationally. It was very and, say, and you know that I am not a Michael Bay fan, but the way that he marketing and like basically selling his soul to the way that he did it inside of the movie, like marketing everything and it, you were marketing or catering it towards an international office. Right. It got the money. It you could smell it from a mile away, but it made money. So as far as making money, that's why these things are going to keep getting made. Now, if you would have asked me a year ago, I would have told you Transformers because of this idea of Stephen Denight sitting in a room, and they have all these people sitting in a room and coming up with new ways to revitalize the franchise. The, the very question that you're asking, but then you hear of all the stuff that's happening, and you hear Michael, but he's not going to change. It's just the same it? thing. It's the same thing. Is that you're not going to get anything different from this movie if he, uh, John, like John says, if he's directing. Pirates could 
trick you or, or could surprise you. Pirates They've got could, a couple of new directors on the Pirates. They're bringing they in different things. Yeah, maybe there's something new. And Javier Bardem is never a, a bad thing. So they, right. there's something in there that you could say, well, that's a different way. As long as they don't just put it on Jack Sparrow's shoulders again and go, that's our one trick pony. Let's go with him. Right. And don't make him front and center the whole damn time because it's Pirates of the Caribbean. It's not, it shouldn't just be a Jack Sparrow movie. It should definitely have and people are going to see it for him. But if they try to maneuver it, very similar to what, because if you would have put this, again, five, six years ago and thrown in Fast and the Furious in there, no one would have picked Fast and the Furious. Right. But then Fast and Furious 5 comes out and just turns it all on our head and becomes this crazy over-the-top action movie, not just a, a point break ripoff. Right. You know, it, it is, it, there's possibilities that pirates could do it in a different way if they spin just a little bit to the right. Just to clarify, uh, the last Transformers made just over $1.1 yeah. $1. $1 billion worldwide. The last Pirates of the Caribbean movie made just over $1 billion wow. worldwide. So, Schnepp, which one of these two franchises has a better chance of turning it around? Uh, neither. They both suck. But I love the idea of Pirates <laughs> v. Transformers. Just like, <laughs> like seeing that was like, I would see that movie over seeing e either one individually. I would see Johnny Depp as a Transformer in a giant, like, robotic pirate ship fighting, a, you know, Optimus Prime. Just that idea alone has made me excited. Just myself, you guys can think that. Like a more sucks. primitive form of Transformers. Because the yeah. ones they got now are going to take down Pirates Steam pretty Punk. easily. But it's Steampunk, Steampunk Pirates. Transformers, <laughs> yeah. fighting pirates. It's craziness. I want to see it. You That's know, $2 billion. I would have been on your train uh, a few weeks ago before I saw that the, the new Pirates trailer. Because I was out of town when you guys talked about it. I thought it was tremendous. I thought they did a great oh, really? job. Yeah, I yeah, thought I they like did the a great job selling sure, that. Sure. If for no other reason than to echo Christian's sentiments that that trailer at least did not rely on Captain Jack Sparrow at all. Totally. They mentioned they were looking for him, or but but that was that was so creepy. Oh, yeah. And seeing Javier Bardem reveal he looks like he's committed to this thing for the long haul. So I'm excited artistically. I'm more excited about pirates, but I think you know the Transformers. At this point, we have to acknowledge that, like Family Feud, you always have that one like idiot cousin that just shows up and you can't <laughs> kick him out because he's part of the family. That's what Transformers. <laughs> Is. There's, it's just the idiot that's always going to be coming out. We're always going to get excited. Then we're always going to be let down. And it's going to make a boatload of money worldwide. So Transformers, congratulations. You're in the family. Just nobody likes you. All right, what's next? <laughs> Big Ed writes, Hey, Collider Ed. crew, after the horrible masterminds and the dour, sour reviews with the with Keeping Up With The Joneses, are we done with Zach Galifianakis on a cinematic level? Has his hangover goodwill run out? Okay, look. It's, yeah, Masterminds was an unmitigated, sloppy, horrible piece of crap movie. It was terrible. Uh, Keeping Up With The Joneses was better, but it's terrible. But it's, all, it, it's also bad. Um, but here's my thing. When we, talked, we came out of Masterminds, one of the things that I said coming out of Masterminds was that, you know what, you could tell every actor in it was trying their best to make something out of nothing. And, you know, you cannot, there was, out of all the problems with Mastermind, Zach Galifianakis and what the performance he tried to bring was not one of the problems. That wasn't the problem with it. So I give him a pass on that. When we talk about keeping up with the Joneses, it's almost the identical scenario. This movie was doomed from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And like, not Zach Galifianakis, not Isla Fisher. And look, and I said this the other day about Gal Gadot, like, is she bad in this film? She looks bad in this film, but you cannot hold that against her because Zach Galifianakis looked bad in this film. Isla Fisher looked bad in this film, and they're good. So, I, I, again, I don't hold any of the performers in there against them that this movie turned out bad. Look, Zach Galifianakis is a funny, funny dude. He's got a great sense of on-screen timing. He almost made Masterminds watchable, but even he couldn't pull it out. So, no, I don't, I don't chalk the failure of Masterminds or Keeping Up With The Joneses up to being Zach Galifianakis' fault at all. I still think he's got a lot of great stuff to give us on screen. Schnapp, what do you think? Yeah, I don't think he's out by you know, any any kind of long shot at all i mean if all you have to do is watch baskets season one it's fantastic it's weird it's hilarious and i can't wait to see hopefully they're doing a basket season two because that's some like experimental comedy on the next level stuff and that's zach galifianakis and louis ck i think zach galifianakis is hilarious but sometimes you you're in a in a horrible film sometimes you make stuff as somebody who's made a ton of stuff there's a lot of stuff that you'll never see that i made because it maybe it sucked but you know you have your hits you have your misses that's your career it's not every single thing there's a few people that you're like oh my god look at that guy like spielberg he's like look at his track record there's a couple of you know little tarnished things here and there but most of them are out of the park great films some are just okay 
You know what I mean? But there's a couple in there that are like, eh, you know, it didn't come out the way you wanted it to or whatever. And you just move on. So I think someone like Zach Galifianakis is super funny. He's super talented. He's got two movies. They were shot really far apart, but because Masterminds Years and all apart. this. Yeah. yeah, because Masterminds had these problems. They both came out within the two, like a month of each other. And they both, I guess, suck. I didn't see either one of them, but, you know, that's how it works. I don't think that's Zach Galifianakis' fault. No, I, I think he's got a lot to offer the world of movies, particularly on the dramatic side, though. I mean, if you just see like, little bit parts Man. of his head. And, yeah, How good was he in Birdman? That, and he's got a little part in Up in the Air where he gets fired, and it's just you just see. So there's a little bit of comedy in there. There's a lot of drama in there, too. So you could see him as like a John C. Riley as far as on screen goes, where he can be very funny and, and ridiculous and silly, but he also has dramatic chops that he can add to it. I have been let down by some of his comedies, though, and not just these most recent. So, like, I thought Due Date could have been funnier. I thought that the election movie he was in with Will Ferrell should have been funnier. That The Hangover sequel should have been better. I don't pin that all on Galifianakis, though, so I think he's got a long, thriving career left. Christian? I think that he should take a break from comedy. I think that for I – mean, do I still think he's a funny guy? Yeah, but t take a break. And I uh, to agree, that was going to be my point also. It's, he was great in Birdman. He's very talented, and I think – well, not break from comedy altogether but in films because you're right. The TV and, and even uh, the, the thing he does with the ferns on – Between two ferns. Is, is amazing. Yeah. So I would – and if he's going to do comedy, he shouldn't be front and center. He's, good, he's, not, he's not a front and center guy, and I don't blame him for giving, giving it a shot. I don't give it uh, – he's – there's the movies that he does, even with the Hangover movies, his – obviously his best comedic roles so far, he's not front and center. And when he was put a little bit more front and center in two, I thought it was terrible. I thought he was he became unlikable. So I think when you pepper him in in these roles, I think he could be really good, really funny. He's very talented, but I'd rather see him in dramatic roles because it'll – also take away people like the perception of always oh, trying to be the funny guy once again and showing what he can do because he's he's got more than just being the funny guy and you know what he's going to be the voice of the joker in the yep. upcoming lego batman movie so let's keep our eyes open for mm -hmm. that all right what's next Edmund Suzuki writes, I'm a big fan of both Marvel and DC. Every movie either puts out as a major event to me. Like Campia, I enjoyed all three current DC films, but even as a fan, I acknowledge that they are trailing far behind Marvel right now in terms of quality. I love the Wonder Woman and Justice League trailers, but trailers don't mean too much. So I need to hear your wisdom. What does WB have to do at this point to catch up to Marvel? How do they get back on the right track? Thanks. I think the answer for, for because I, I'm with you. Like, first of all, I think Man of Steel is a masterpiece. I love Man of Steel. I like it more and more every time I watch it. Uh, Batman vs. Superman, I liked it, but it should have been better. Uh, Suicide Squad, I liked it. Should have been better, though. What I think Warner Brothers needs to do is, number one, get their focus off this tone nonsense. The pro I've said this a thousand times. The problem with Batman, the problems with Batman v Superman, the problems with Suicide Squad had nothing to do with tone. It wasn't tone. Nobody complained about tone in Nolan's Batman films. And they were pretty grim and dark and all that kind of stuff, too. Pro tone wasn't the problem. Here's what I think Warner Brothers needs to do. I think they need to start skinning a couple of comic book movies and here's what I mean by skinning it's it's a it's a website term like so if I have a website and let's say the Simpsons was gonna buy some some ad time what I can then do is skin my website in a Simpsons outline so the background is all Simpsons stuff some of my icons might change the Simpsons stuff what I would do if I was Warner Brothers is take a great script that maybe you don't think has a chance to actually make it right but you think the script is great take that great script and then skin a DC movie over top of it you know just if you just, fo they need to start focusing on a great movie first, then make it a great DC movie second. Start with the great movie, keep your focus there, and then skin it and work it into a DC time frame, and into a DC uh, course frame. If you do that, and you focus just on making a good movie, it'll turn it around. Look, Suicide Squad was not the greatest movie. It made big bank, over $700 million, right? People want to see DC movies. People want to see these movies. Mm -hmm. They're going to come out. Now start focusing. Put your focus on not how to get more butts in the seats because that will take care of itself. Focus on a good movie first. Worry about a good DC movie second. Anyway, that's just how I see it. Schnapp, what do you think? I agree. I mean, I think let alone just using the property that exists, DC comics are, come from comic books. There's hundreds of thousands of amazing stories that they're not using. So... Any amalgam of any of the stories that, you know, you always hear like, oh, well, you know, Batman v Superman used elements of The Dark Knight Returns. Well, not the right elements. So, I mean, I, the story is the most 
important part of any film, the story, the backbone, the spine of the story. Then comes the dialogue, the scripting. That is the most important thing. If you don't have that and that does not work, your film doesn't work. I don't care how great it looks, how amazing the cinematography is. If a story is garbage, you have a garbage film. Now, some things clean up better than others. I think Suicide Squad, I enjoyed it. I mean, are there a ton of problems there? Yes, there's a lot of problems there, especially the last act. There's a ton of problems, but I was able to get past that because it was a lot of fun. So I had a lot of fun and I didn't expect it to win any Oscars. So I wasn't coming in there like, man, I can't wait for Suicide Squad to change my life. I just wanted to see a fun <laughs> action film with a Joker and Harley Quinn, and a bunch of weirdos fighting some weird dirt monsters. That's what I saw. Some other stuff, I, you know, I would have changed if I could have or hoped that some other people like, hey, give them another month with the script or something. But you know what? I mean, with their three out of the gate, I equated to Iron Man, The Incredible Hulk and Iron Man 2. That's where they are, just like Marvel was. They have three out of the gate. If you go back in time and you're like back there in 2009, you're like, I don't know about these Marvel films. Well, the Hulk didn't do so well. Iron Man 2 was kind of a hmm. You know what I mean? Well, we got these other films to look forward to. That's where we are in the DC world. So catching up, you know, you got to relax for a minute and just think about where you are. So that's, See, that's I thought where Suicide Squad was going to change my life. Oh, I was well. I was ready. I had to return the dead <laughs> shot costume. It was a very embarrassing August for me. I think the problem with Focus is that they're focusing on Marvel, and that's what the question was, is what do you have to do to catch up to Marvel? Stop worrying about Marvel. Yep. Stop, just, yeah. m Marvel doesn't exist, okay? Stop, stop, stop looking at the numbers. Stop looking at the critical responses. Just make your movie. Just focus on your movies, and it's really hard for me to tell if that is all a fan-driven competition, or if it actually is in the highest offices of Warner Brothers in D.C. when they're looking at Marvel and they're like, you know, they're, they're, it's like a beautiful mind they're trying to figure out how to beat marvel if that is the case stop worrying about it just make your movies don't even pay attention to what marvel is doing focus on you well listen competition breeds competition so i have no problem with them trying to say hey we want to try to catch marvel but you do need to focus on what's happening in your universe but you have to be fair to dc they have the the universe itself the dc cinematic universe is a baby it's you have it's it is. It's like Man of Steel came out in what, two thousand twelve mm -hmm. or something? Yeah. Thirteen, I think, yeah. Iron Man was two thousand and eight. Eight. So and the, here's the other here's the other thing that, that DC needs to focus on. Here's Marvel throughout that time period. John Favreau, James Gunn, uh, you know, uh, Ryan Coogler, Joss Whedon, Kenneth Branagh, the list goes on and on and on. DC, Zack Snyder, David Ayer. And then you're gonna have Zack Snyder again. And then Patty Jenkins. So They've got to change it up, and, and it's not, this isn't an against Zack Snyder thing. Let him go. Just let him go. <laughs> it's like, no more Snyder. Like, one more movie, let him do Justice League, and that's it. Because, and not because of anything about his particular talents. Change it up. That's what Marvel's been doing that has been so interesting and different with their franchises, that when I saw Captain America Civil War, I mean, excuse me, Captain America um, Winter Soldier, I was watching a spy movie. When I was watching Ant-Man, with Peyton Reed, I was watching a heist film. I was watching these different things. I haven't found that yet with DC, and it certainly can happen and will happen. Getting a James Wan for Aquaman, again, changing your director self up, we're getting that. So that's how they're gonna start to, if you wanna say catch up, but that's how you start playing in the same realm. You don't have to catch up to them because they have so many years ahead of you. It's like a, a, a brand new franchise in sports that's trying to catch the, 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 you know, the Yankees or, or the Bulls. They just have, their, there's, more, there's more legacy to it. They've, they've been around longer so you're not going to catch up but you can follow what they're doing by changing genre and adding more talent all right guys hey listen where you are we're running long but you know what we're still going to squeeze in some of your twitter questions if you're watching us live start firing in your live questions to us make sure you're following us on twitter at collider video fire on in your questions and wendy will pick a couple out for us to ask at the end but before we get those we got one more mailbag question ashley what do we got Ryan Clark writes, I was looking at upcoming movie release dates and November 4th caught my eye because it has three major releases, Hacksaw Ridge, Trolls, and Doctor Strange. So my question to you guys is what movie do you think will be number one at the box office that weekend? Will Marvel keep their streak of being number one alive or will one of the other films come out on top? We'll love to hear your thoughts. Strange is, is, is gonna be fine. Uh, Hacksaw Ridge looks like it's gonna be an amazing best picture contender, but it's also a best picture contender, which normally is like a $70 million opening weekend. Trolls is a family film, but the trailers have not been crushing it. I think Doctor Strange is very, very, very safely going to come in at number one. I agree. I can't. I've seen Hacksaw Ridge. Can't talk about it yet, but I will. <gasps> but I will say that you're right. It's an Oscar. It's an Oscar movie. The movie that is going to. It's. It'll be Strange and then Trolls. 
Yeah, it'll be Strange and Trolls and Hacksaw Ridge. At number four, I got Hacksaw Ridge. Three, I got Trolls. Two, I got Doctor Strange. And number one, I'm going to surprise some people. Fifty Shades Darker. <laughs> <laughs> Hanging on to that number one spot. All right, guys, listen, I want to remind you that Movie Talk is not the only show on Collider Video today. A little bit later today, we got Collider Heroes of John Schnepp coming up. We're going to talk a little bit more about the whole Guardians thing. And at 5 p.m., we got the Top 10 show. Keep your eyes peeled. And also look for breaking news that we drop once in a while here on Collider Video as well. All right, let's get to those Twitter questions. Wendy, what have you picked out? Matt Molina says, which director would get, would get you excited and on board for a new Willy Wonka? That's actually a great question. Right. And you know what? I... I want to go against the grain. I, I'm thinking bring in a director with a lot of very, with a dramatic feel. You know what? I'm going to draw from your playbook. I'm going to go O'Connor. Yeah. Mm. I think that would be an interesting uh, addition to a story like that. That could. There's a lot of really interesting mention. I would go somebody who comes more from a dramatic background. What do you think? Kubrick. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want anybody. He doesn't Mark, want anybody. He's, he's, what do you think, Christian? I think dead. you know you're going to keep it in the Potter family. Give David Yates a shot at. Uh, he's he is busy, but yeah, why not? That's a good one. Is he going to do all? The, is he doing all the? This fantastic. I ha we have not heard who's going to direct the next one, but yeah. I mean, hey, he works with this producer very well. Right. So why Peter not? Jackson. If Yates was smart, he'd stick with Fantastic Beasts because he's doing such a great right, job. Right. Um, I I'm sure he's yeah he's very smart. Um, Ryan Johnson. I'm going to say you know why not? That guy's incredibly intelligent. I'd love to see him take on Roald Dahl stuff. All right, what's next? Nick Crocker writes, with all the black and white images from Logan, do you think that we'll get an all black and white film? No. No. Absolutely no. not. It's going to be chance. full color. It might be a lot of burnt sienna going on, <laughs> yeah. but... <laughs> but they might do that thing they did with Mad Max Fury Road where they re-release it in theaters and have it in black and white. Because didn't George Miller, yeah. like, originally film Mad Max to be in black and white, and then well, they, 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 they put color in it? Not really, but <laughs> uh, they're releasing it as chrome and white, mm. you know? Chrome and black. What he said. All right, what's next? <laughs> Christopher Royce <laughs> says, if you see a film during the embargo, do you film a review immediately or wait until the embargo is lifted? Uh, it really depends. I, I mean, a lot of times, if we see it, we want to keep it fresh. We'll want to shoot a, uh, a review as soon as we can, then we just hold until the embargo lists. And sometimes, if we're not really excited about it, we'll just... If there's, like, if there's three weeks' worth of embargo, we'll probably put it off a little bit. But if it's within a week, we probably shoot as soon as we can. Yeah, it depends. I mean, the, for example, like, like I mentioned, Hacksaw Ridge, and he still needs to see it. So I'm going to wait until he sees it, and then if the embargo still <laughs> lifted, we'll probably shoot it anyway, just so, we, so we, the thoughts are fresh. We already shot our Rogue One review, though. Right. And so that's just in right. the can, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, you guys liked it, right? Um, it's better than episode eight. All right, well, yeah. that's good. Yeah, I've heard episode eight has some problems. Yeah, yeah, nine we're, we're gonna be We're going to be seeing Doctor Strange tomorrow, and we're tomorrow probably going to shoot something because we could what? release it. Yeah, October 23rd. Yeah, so. Schnepp got into the premiere. What? Yeah. He came, yeah. he knocked on my, he knocked on my, because I, I got my invitation to the premiere of Doctor Strange, and then le last night he knocks on the door of my office while I was having a meeting, and he comes and goes, sorry, interrupt your meeting. I got into the Doctor Strange premiere. I like, yeah, I was yes. like a little kid. Like, I was like, I gotta he tell was so someone. Happy. Whoa, jumping around. That so. reminds me, catch the Schmoes No Lies show tomorrow <laughs> night while these guys are at the Doctor Strange premiere. All right, what's next? Derek Spicer says, would you like to see Adonis Creed fight Ronda Rousey in a chair in a charity bout similar to the Rocky Hulk Hogan fight in Rocky Three? <laughs> you know nice. what? Was, before Ronda Rousey got her ass kicked by Holly Holm, that's something you could have done. I don't think it would carry the same no. panache now that that. It did uh, that it did before? No, I wouldn't like to see that. Thunder thighs. Yeah. That was what <laughs> Hulk Hogan was called, right? Uh, Thunder, Thunder lips. Thunder lips. Oh, well, Goldberg's back now. Maybe have versus the Goldberg. ultimate meatball. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's take two more. Would you want to see him fight Conor McGregor? McGregor. It's too small. Ooh, yes, he's too small. That's, but uh, but would be silly. But, I mean, it would, Conor yeah, McGregor's it, like this. Yeah, Adonis Creed's like six Hulk, feet tall. Hogan and and and, um, and right. uh, because, I think it was, was huge of size. Of course, difference. because that's that's the whole point. Is that the wrestler, the big huge wrestler, was going up against our fighter? If, if Adonis Creed's you kick him, but the he's crap one of the most dangerous human beings alive. Of course he is, yeah. but that that it's not that, a documentary. It would look silly. He's punching down. He can't. No, no. <laughs> All right, let's take two more. All right, this one comes from Canadian Pat four nine three, and he says. What Miyazaki film do you think would translate best into live action? I would love to see Princess Mononoke or Spirited Away. I would I would vote for uh, Totoro because mm -hmm. I think seeing that Totoro as a, a giant creature would be really fun. I would go with Spirited Away, I think, over Totoro. If you're talking about which would actually translate best to the screen, I think Princess Mononoke. I think that's the mm. one that would translate the best. Um, it might not be the one that I would want that the most. That would be giant budget. I was also, Huge in my budget. mind, yeah. just tampering the budget a little bit because both Spirited Way and Mononoke would be insane budget. Totoro, 
you can pull it off. You got a cat bus. You got a little pal. You know? Christian, I haven't seen either one. Okay, fair enough. All right, last question of the day. Okay, uh, this one comes from Dunn, and he says, who so far has the best Hollywood career amongst the Chris's? Chris Evan, Chris Pines, Chris Hemsworth, and Chris Pratt. Thanks. Christian Arlo. Who's the last, who's the last one? Chris Pratt. Ooh. Chris Pratt. Uh, now, Pratt will probably yeah. end up with the best one when it's all said and done. Maybe, but at this point, I'm going to say Evans. I'm going to say Evans at this point probably does. What do you guys think? Well, yeah, I mean, well, Evans was the Human Torch before he was Captain America. Now he's Captain America in like 25 different Marvel films. And, and he, he was great do, in The Losers. I love. He was I really great in like the, losers. the Losers. Yeah, I got Chris Pratt, man. I think Pratt for what he did. Remember, this was a guy that was playing kind of the the chunky best friend. Here and there, just sure. riding comic relief, and then gets a hit TV show. Well, no, if we're going to include, and I guess we should, if you're going to include TV, it's about career. It's yeah. a career in Hollywood, which includes Parks and Rec. Is just yeah, that's ball, what I'm saying. Right? So he, and he, he builds his reputation there, and there's not a lot of guys that do that, that that transfer over from just being the comic relief, and now he's leading man in Jurassic stuff. World. Jurassic yeah. World. He's, he's in, got and more was, franchises than, uh, than yeah. I mean, I mean, Chris Evans. You know, God love him, he's great as Captain America. He did, uh, um, you know, the the movie that he directed. That you know didn't really make a dent. Um, the one on the train. I yeah. love the train movie. Um, you know, never go back. I believe his name of it, and that was good. <laughs> yeah. But Hemsworth, same thing. It's like he's great as Thor, but we haven't really seen him in a. He's been, he's made good movies, but none of them have had the blockbuster appeal of right. Chris Pratt, uh, who can do either Guardians or Jurassic, uh, or maybe he's always up for Indiana Jones or Uncharted, or maybe Passengers is great. So I'll tell you what, though, if Pine keeps putting out performances like Hell or High Water, he's yeah. in the conversation. Yeah, no, that, Pine that, might that, be living the script in the next couple of years. Yeah. We'll all be talking about Pine. So. It'll be interesting to see. All right, guys, that'll do it for us for this elongated version of uh, Clyde Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember, the most important part of our show is what do you guys think about all the stuff we talked about? Jump into the comments section and leave your thoughts. I want to thank the guy sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting over there, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. You can find Collider Heroes, where we got sweaty earlier today. It's recorded. It's coming at you at 2 p.m. Check out my uh, YouTube channel, The Schnepp Zone. I got a horror film that I'm popping up before Halloween. Sitting right beside me, Mr. Christian Harloff. Well, Christian Harloff on Twitter and Instagram, and obviously Collider Jedi Council every Thursday. But tomorrow night on the Schmo Show, we have a very big announcement happening, and I would love for the Collider crew to come on over tomorrow night live on the Schmo Show. Pretty big announcement. Right over here, Mr. Mark Ellis. Said Schmo Show is 7 p.m. PST. That's 10 p.m. for you East Coasters. And as for me, well, I wasn't just upset today because of Willy Wonka. There's been a thorn in my side all week, and I finally get to extract it on Friday when I take down the outlaw, John Roca, and I embarrass him winning the ultimate Schmodown belt. <laughs> Pardon me. Sitting over there, we got Ashley and Wendy. Ashley, where can we find you? Do you need the Heimlich? Yeah. <laughs> you can find me giving him the Heimlich. And on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Wednesday, guys. And Wendy Lee. You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and also on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And you can simply follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at John Campia. Make sure you subscribe to Comic Con HQ to follow mine and John Schnepp's show, Film HQ, new episodes every Saturday. Special thanks to all the guys in the room and a special thanks to you guys. Thanks for joining us. My name's John Campia. And until next time, bye bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.